The Anderson Language and Technology Center at CU Boulder is committed to broadening and deepening cultural understanding. Alltech offers non-credit language classes in person and remotely to everyone year-round. Our flexible and engaging format makes language learning a breeze for anyone. So join a community of like-minded and motivated students who are passionate about traveling and experiencing the world. Jump into our summer session with a 20% discount using the code ALLTECHFUN. Learn more at alltech.colorado.edu. Hello, my name is Aston Horton, a junior here at CU studying International Affairs. Along with the International Affairs Subcommittee at the Conference on World Affairs, we are ecstatic to provide to you today a panel entitled Africa on the Rise, a, t a continent overcoming its challenges. Our panelists today have a wealth of experience and knowledge of Africa, both from within the continent and from the international space, that will provide a very interesting conversation about the current events of Africa today. We hope you enjoy this panel. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the CU Boulder Conference on World Affairs panel, Africa on the Rise, a continent overcoming its challenges. My name is Thomas Gibb. I'm a Boulder native and a CU graduate. I've worked in international development for over 20 years and lived and worked in many countries across Africa. I'm especially excited to be your moderator today for this panel. Um, we'll start off with opening statements from our panelists, then we'll follow that with a brief discussion among the panelists about their opening statements. Then we'll move on to Q&A from the audience. <coughs> you may submit your questions at any time through the YouTube chat. We'll also invite you to share if you're a CU student and also share where you're joining us from around the world. All the CWA panels are being recorded on YouTube and will be available to watch immediately after the event on the CU YouTube channel. So first, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Bassioni, who will be our first panelist. He's had an illustrious career in international development and now leads the Bassioni Group, uh, which works to empower communities and international institutions through sustainable development and mutually beneficial public-private partnerships and socially responsible investments. Dr. Bassioni is a former government minister, a diplomat, and international development professional. He served in senior positions at the United Nations for over 20 years. He was the first ever UN humanitarian coordinator and the only coordinator directly appointed by the UN Secretary General and the Security Council. He's also served as a UNICEF country representative in countries across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Dr. Bassioni is a graduate of veterinary medicine from Khartoum University and earned his master's degree in public administration from Harvard University. So with that, I welcome Dr. Bassioni for his opening remarks. Take it away, Dr. Bassioni. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and it's a pleasure to join you and the Colorado team. I wish to thank uh, uh, Katie Grady and the team for, for organizing and, um, uh, and launching this uh, panel. I'm glad that the panel is positive and forward-looking, Africa on the rise. 
I plan to uh, present this in, in an attempt to answer three questions. The first question is, what is Africa? The second one is, where is Africa at this time? And the third one is, where is Africa going? And the first one is very simple. This is a continent of about 30.5 km square kilometers, the size of Europe, China, and the US put together. Uh, it has a population of 1.3 billion, of which has the youngest population in the world with a median age of 1.9, as uh, sorry, 19.7 as compared to 30.4 worldwide. Uh, it has the largest uh, mineral reserves of the world. So the question is, can will the world can the world do without Africa, and can Africa do without the world? I go to the second point. Answer is where is Africa now? Africa has I uh, five major problems. First one is really that there is an increase in poverty. Uh, there is a contraction of about uh, one two point one percent uh, in its growth, and that has uh, thrown about thirty million. Africans into poverty. It has a staggering debt, which will grow from about 10% to 15%. It has a lack of, lack of good governance and democracy. Uh, it has what I call the China mixed blessings. On the one hand, China provides easy direct uh, credit and investment to the, to the continent. On the other, it is making it difficult for the countries and governments of the continent to actually achieve good governance, democracy, and justice. Uh, the, the COVID-19 the COVID is a, a, the pandemic is with Africa to stay, and that's a major problem. I now move quickly uh, to where Africa wants to go. And I say that uh, uh, because of, uh, uh, of institutions, of governments, of countries and institutions, there are a number of achievements in Africa today, which we need to take note of. They are achievements in governance, achievements in democracy, in business and in society. And uh, if we take this quite seriously, they're given encouragement, they're given support, they will individually and collectively transform and be, bring about a transformational change in Africa. And I, call, I choose to call them the beacons of hope because this theme of the, uh, 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 of the conference on uh, Africa on the rise is based on some solid things happening in Africa, which we need to uh, take note of. There are hundreds, but I've chosen to dwell on about 12 only. Number one, Africa is recovering from the worst recession in half a century. It's believed that Africa will make a growth of 3.4% in 2021. Number two, there are opportunities for relieving the debt burden of Africa. Uh, there are now, where the creditors and international monetary agencies are now more ready than ever to help to listen to Africa's uh, story of the vicious cycle of debt. And I think that is a, a good, that is good news. Number three, the economic community of West Africa states and peace in that region. This is a body that has uh, intervened forcefully in several countries uh, to uh, stop uh, crisis, man-made crises. It has established uh, governments in those areas and it has restored peace. So ECOWAS is a blessing. Number four, the dynamic and restive uh, youthful population. We said the youthful population of 19.7 median age um, is dynamic and one of the strongest in Africa. And it has a large buying power. Number five, uh, number four, sorry. Uh, oh, maybe, sorry, five, it is. There is a growing middle class over the last decade or so there have been a, a phenomenal uh, growth in uh, the middle class uh, with about a, a dozen billionaires now in Africa. That is also a huge buying power.
in Africa. Uh, there is the issue of uh, a policy which, for which Obama would be, uh, President Obama will be remembered. He actually shifted the aid to business. And he felt that uh, Africans want to be helped, to help themselves. And therefore, he will be remembered most of, of course, by his light for Africa, which is, was a, uh, is, is a major undertaking, and also by youth, uh, the Yali uh, project that he initiated. Uh, number, number seven, the Somalis, Somali remittances. Uh, people, Somali send yearly home about $1.3 billion of, of money to their relatives and to their friends in Somalia. And that exceeds all humanitarian development assistance to the country. With, and, and comprise about 25 to 40% uh, percent of the country's uh, economy. Number eight, what they call Kenya and the Building Bridges Initiative, BBI. Uh, so, you know, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya and the opposition leader, uh, leader Raila Odinga, uh, surprised the world and surprised the country by over a handshake. Uh, uh, signing uh, the BBI Pact, uh, which uh, gave equitable power sharing and also equalization of representation, and more importantly, the uh, leveling of the political playing field. Number nine, South Sudan. Uh, this is a country that, after the center of this long and tortuous war, won its independence in 2011. Uh, 2011. And thanks to President Bush and this country, uh, South Sudan was able to gain a sovereign status. But since 2013, this country has self-inflicted, uh, uh, you know, uh, driven itself into the worst uh, state of displacement of populations internally, externally, a great suffering, women and children, the elderly, and it is in the worst, it is short of collapsing economically and being a failed state. And yet, uh, this uh, US that midwifed South Sudan to come into being as a state has turned its back on the country. And that's something that we need to take up here. Uh, number 10, all of you have heard how recently we lost uh, John Magafuli, the president of Tanzania. Uh, who sometimes is described as uh, a criticized for being authoritarian. Uh, but uh, in his six years in office, he brought about a draconian uh, uh, policy and system of management that has really result transformed Tanzania by reducing public spending, by reducing cor corruption, and by establishing extensive infrastructure and improving basic social services. So, I always know that in, in the worst uh, personality or a person in the world, there is always something good, one single thing good. And I always try to find what that nugget is in that particular person. Number 11, the president of, uh, uh, of uh, Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, uh, when he came into power, he reached out to his colleague, uh, Isaiah Afroweke of uh, Eritrea, and the two signed an agreement, a peace agreement, which uh, restored uh, normal relations between the two countries and brought about uh, stability in the Horn of Africa, one of the most uh, important regions in Africa. Uh, number 12, the last one uh, of the uh, beacons, of t uh, beacons of hope is that Rwanda and women leadership. Uh, President Kagame uh, has pursued a very aggressive um, uh, uh, gender equity policy so that women in, 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 in uh, Rwanda uh, find it it's easier for them to rise and, and operate at the higher echelons of power in government and in public service than they can ever hope to do in the West. Uh, and they are mentioned only by Ethiopia when Abiy Ahmed formed a government of 50-50, 50 men, 50 women, and appointed the first defense minister as a woman. But Rwanda beats uh, Ethiopia uh, again 
by that 64% of the members of parliament of uh, Rwanda are women. And this is a feat which even uh, the US Congress cannot beat. So those are the 12 beacons of hope. And let me leave with you what I call call for action. And uh, number one is that, uh, and you will be surprised that it has nothing to do with Africa. It has to do with the US and yourselves. Uh, it is about uh, uh, ensuring that we can actually introduce and not introduce, but strengthen, uh, promote world history and world geography in the American education system. Because if America has to help the world and be part of the world, then America has to know the world. And it is now, judging it from my own grandchildren, America does not know the world. America needs history. America needs geography. Uh, number two, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, America has been lacking, the foreign policy has been uh, jaggered in a way. We have seen the, for, the policies of withdrawal in Somalia, uh, for policy of isolationism, but what is important is that we would like to see with the advent of uh, uh, President uh, Biden now coming to power, an announcement of um, uh, you know, a major policy statement on Africa, uh, premised on the national security of US and based on good governance, democracy, re and respect for human and civil rights and investment for self-reliance. Number two, Thank number three. Dr. Bassioni, we're gonna, we're gonna have to transition to the, thank you, but we're gonna have to transition to the next uh, okay, speaker. We'll have some additional time during the uh, discussion period to cover some of the points that you may have missed. Thank you. Um, and now I wanna welcome Michelle Gavin, who's a senior fellow for African studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Michelle has over 20 years experience in international affairs. In addition to having been the managing director for the Africa Center, advancing thought and action around Africa's global influence and impact, she also served as the ambassador to Botswana, while at the same time being the US representative to the Southern African Development Community, or SADC. Under her diplomatic leadership, the United States and Botswana launched the most ambitious HIV prevention study in the world. She also <coughs> led the U.S. Embassy to found the first Botswana America Chamber of Commerce. Before serving as ambassador to Botswana, Gavin served as special assistant to President Obama and as the senior director for Africa at the National Security Council where she helped originate the Young African Leaders Initiative, or YALI, as it's known across the continent. So with that, I welcome Michelle to provide her insights on Africa and uh, looking forward to the future. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to join you today. Uh, and I'm gonna try and keep it brief because I can't wait to talk to my fellow panelists and to hear the Q&A. So broadly, I, I kind of wanted to uh, maybe throw a little bit of a spanner in the works here about this kind of Africa on the rise narrative, which uh, I believe in in a lot of ways and we'll get to that, but I would caution everyone to be wary of these big generalizations and meta narratives about a vast and incredibly diverse continent. There was a famous uh, cover of The Economist magazine uh, several years ago uh, with a big picture of Africa, it called it the hopeless continent. Then a decade later, there was another one, big cover story, Africa rising. But here's the thing, Africa's never doing all one thing or all the other, right? The political and economic outlook in a <laughs> Kenya, say, uh, and David talked about the Building Bridges Initiative, some exciting developments there. It looks really different in Kenya in terms of what the trend lines look like than say next door in Somalia, right? Where they're um, on the verge of losing a lot of very hard won uh, political and uh, security ground. 
the outlook in Ghana, one of the most dynamic uh, economies on the continent, the most resilient democracies, I'm sure Pauline will have more to say about it, uh, looks really different than neighboring Burkina Faso, which is struggling uh, with this metastasizing terrorist movement that's gripped the Sahel um, and is setting back a lot of regional plans. So it's very uh, dangerous, I think, to sort of assume that continental trend lines uh, all move in one direction. But with that said, and acknowledging that there still are places in Africa where basic security concerns absolutely must vie for the, the top spot of prioritization in terms of policy preoccupation. I would posit that if we're going to generalize, the really big challenge for Africa is job creation. So David talked a little bit about the extraordinary demographics of the continent. Right, continent-wide, you've got 60% of the population under 25 years of age. In a lot of the democracies uh, in Africa, if first-time voters voted as a block, they'd decide every election because that, that cohort is that much bigger than the rest of the enfranchised population. It is a youth-dominated region. And what that means is when we look at say growth figures and there are some African countries with very impressive growth numbers, they've been set back by COVID of course, but we need to ask ourselves how inclusive is that growth and how much job creation comes with it? Because the, the real imperative here is, is finding opportunities for these vast numbers of people moving into the labor force. Now, if you want to know where the region is going, you've got to understand the concerns, the aspirations, and the opportunities available to young people. It's why I worked on the Young African Leaders Initiative for President Obama, and it's why I do think it's incredibly important in trying to get to know any given country and understand the trajectory, the pitfalls, and the potential uh, that there's more engagement with young people uh, Unfortunately, in Africa also has one of the greatest variations between kind of the age of leadership, both at the executive and the legislative level, and the average age of the population. And this is where civil society voices can help to fill out the picture for us. I hope Pauline talks more about that. So with that really broad framing of African priorities, then just very quickly, I want to touch on this question of for an engagement, does it help or does it harm? And of course the answer is it depends. The interesting thing that's happening right now in terms of external actors engaging with the African continent is that there is no only game in town scenario. There are almost all of the uh, major external powers in the world very much want partnerships in Africa and deepening engagement and that gives African countries more choice, right? A an opportunity to look for the very best partners uh, to help achieve whatever their goals might be. And that is uh, incredibly important. So you've got obviously intense Chinese engagement, US engagement, Europe, but also India, Japan, and critically the Gulf states who are some of the most important external actors, certainly in the Horn of Africa. And all of these external actors want some of the same things. They want access to markets and resources. Uh, they want to keep an eye on strategic sea lanes. They want critically partners for their preferred vision of global governance. And that's really interesting uh, because a more assertive Africa that wants to talk about the structures of global governance, the way our international institutions uh, take shape uh, will probably lead to some significant reform in terms of how power is distributed institutionally. I would just say though, this kind of international engagement absolutely can go wrong. We have historical examples uh, from the Cold War, uh, certainly for, if you take a US perspective where uh, the US found itself supporting uh, governments who were incredibly repressive, who were corrupt, uh, simply because uh, we wanted them on our side and not the Soviet side. And overall, I think there's an important idea about uh, partnering with governments um, 
and this question of stability, right? So every major power will tell you that they're interested in stable partners on the continent. Um, but stability means different things to different people. And I think where Africa is really poised for the greatest growth, it's in places where the idea of stability is a dynamic idea. It doesn't mean one party rules forever or the given head of state is gonna be there you know, in perpetuity. Uh, it's gotta be a, a kind of institutional stability that allows for new voices, new ideas, um, allows for reform, allows for more inclusion, social inclusion, political inclusion, and economic inclusion. So if you take a, a country like Uganda as an example, where they just had a very controversial election, you have to ask yourself, is supporting the president who's been there since the 1980s uh, and whose government now is you know, rolling tanks in the capital to intimidate voters, is that really in the interest of stability, right? Or does stability in Uganda uh, look different? Does it, is it have more flexibility and provide more space? And I think that's an interesting idea uh, to consider going forward. So I'm gonna leave it there so that there's more time for, uh, for discussion, but I'm just so pleased that you've chosen to spend some time thinking about Africa right now. There is no question, it is going to be a very, very important region in terms of international problem solving. You can't address climate change without Africa. You can't tackle infectious disease without Africa. Uh, you can't reform the institutions of global governance without addressing African equities. Uh, so uh, it's never time wasted to really think about the African agenda. And I appreciate the chance to talk with you today. Thank you, Michelle. Some great insights into the wonderful diversity of Africa and some of the policy and in international engagement issues that we're looking at when we uh, think about Africa. I would also like to welcome today Pauline van der Pollen, who will bring us down more to the national and local level when we think about Africa on the rise. With her undergraduate degree from the University of Ghana and a master's degree from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, she's been a tireless advocate for gender and equitable policy issues for almost two decades in Ghana and around the world. She's now a program officer for gender and economic policy, working for the civil society advocacy organization TWN Africa. We'll hear more about that from Pauline. Pauline also convenes a national coalition working on gender and economic justice and is the focal point for the Ghana National Coalition on Mining, organizing community, community groups in mining areas to defend human rights the environment and working for the optimum utilization of Ghana's mineral resources. Pauline is someone you want on your side to ensure people in your community are getting a fair shake. She's also part of a team working more broadly on the Africa Mining Vision and the West African Civil Society Mining Platform. With that, I'd like to welcome Pauline to give her perspective on this panel, Africa on the Rise. Thank you. Hello, and um, I'd also like to say thank you for having me be part of this discussion. And um, I look forward to hearing from the um, different people listening in. Um, I just like to say, um, I think um, Dr. Bassoni and Michelle have already highlighted how um, Africa is much more diverse and uh, complicated than it's given credit for. Normally when people speak about African countries, they seem to take it from the perspective that Africa has a block, but Africa is um, just to take a side step. I mean, when you actually look at a proper map of the world, Africa, Africa is far larger than is, is actually has been depicted forever. And I think that kind of um, depiction of Africa in which we occupy a particular place has also colored how um, our engagement with the rest of the world has been. Now, uh, Dr. Basuni has already indicated that Africa is a country, a continent that is extremely rich in terms of its mineral resources. 
And uh, unfortunately, um, we haven't had the benefit of those mineral resources as much as we should have. Minerals have been extracted from the continent forever as part of the um, pre-colonial and colonial um, economic structures. But we have all come to realize that how the quantum of minerals extracted and the value of the minerals extracted doesn't reflect in um, our societies or has not been, um, has not contributed as significantly as it should have to um, our development. We have some of the largest producers of gold in the world. Niger has the huge uranium resources and it, it, the, the, you can almost take as many countries as you can and find that we have some mineral being uh, extracted from there. However, the benefits, particularly for the communities where the uh, minerals are extracted has been, um, is questionable. And um, in the 1980s, the, um, the, the global financial institutions realized that um, this was something that needed to change. However, the reforms that have taken place have not led to the kind of structural transformation that we have seen on the continent. And um, actually, um, what uh, we are still exporting as much as uh, uh, we possibly can, most of it has been unrefined, little has been processed, and we are still importing at what we need and the balance, uh, the balance sheet is still uh, very much unfavorable to African countries. Now, what COVID-19 has shown us is that we are very, very uh, susceptible to external shocks. Um, although we did not suffer as much in terms of um, casualties as has been ex the experience around the world, our economy still came to a standstill. And we, and we didn't see the kind of, um, kick back uh, our local industry to fill in the space that we needed to, which shows that we already have a challenge. And so when we talk about Africa rising, there are things that need to be addressed, both uh, in terms of our pol politics, but also in terms of our economies. We need to see our economies uh, transformed so that we are seeing much more manufactured and shared along the continent. There's the recent Africa continental free trade area, which is a very exciting prospect for African countries. And I would argue that unless we develop our industry and our ability to reach out to each other as Africans, we still have a bit of a challenge there. And I think our governments are recognizing that. And then they are also taking steps to address that. We hope to see much more of that. But my focus today is on how much uh, the um, community members and civil society voices must be part of the discussion on Africa on the rise. Because whatever happens at the national or the continental level, its, its impacts and its effects are felt much more by the people, the communities in which uh, much of our uh, resources are extracted from. I've already said that uh, although we have seen massive amounts of extractives taken out, communities are still part of the poorest uh, that you might find. And this is despite the fact that communities are also taking part in the extraction process. Now, what we find is most of our governments are heavily focused on uh, foreign direct investment, getting resources from um, outside the continent, the large companies, those with uh, access to large resources. And, that, and in that case, policy also favors large companies and foreign direct investment. But when it comes to communities who are also extracting, there's less attention paid. Now, um, uh, at the beginning, Thomas mentioned we are working on the Africa Mining Vision. And the Africa Mining Vision is um, a framework that seeks to ensure that our extractives plays a much more positive role for our development, economic and social development. And a key aspect of that is the need for our African governments to pay attention to what we call artisanal and small scale mining. Uh, some, some, uh, I think you might call it panhandling, but that is taking place in a much more structured place, uh, um, structure, structured um, dimension on the continent because it's taking place in many communities. It involves millions of people, not necessarily extracting, but also taking part in the whole process from extraction to sales. And communities are, um, are, large, are very much dependent on um, 
small scale mining. And therefore we, uh, as, a, as a TWN Africa and the National Coalition on Mining, we are trying to do our best to ensure that community voices are, are heard and are, are, are participating in discussions around the extractive sector. I think I will just leave it at that point because I, the, we have a discussion coming up and I, I look forward to getting uh, questions and comments from everybody listening, so thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Pauline. Um, it's really great to get the perspective from from Ghana and from West Africa. I also want to be able to open it up to conversation among the panelists, and I think one of the the big issues that we've noticed is the 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 tension between um, you know foreign involvement in African affairs and African economies in different countries. And we know that that can really be a, a big benefit to a country or a region. It could also uh, have a negative impact on a region. And I'm wondering if you could uh, offer some examples of where it's been a positive impact. And I would open it up to Michelle first and then uh, see what the other panelists have to say. Sure. Well, I would be um, inclined maybe to, to point to one of the countries I know best, uh, Botswana. Uh, so Botswana is an upper middle income country today. But at independence in 1966, it was at the bottom of nearly every development index. And so how did they do that? Um, and there, there was a role, right, for external actors. Uh, but the really critical thing about Botswana's story is uh, that they sort of set the terms. So they did it with diamond wealth. Um, for a long time, Botswana was the largest exporter of gem quality diamonds in the world. Um, and it's important to note that Botswana is not the only resource rich uh, country, right? And it's even in its neighborhood. Angola is uh, incredibly rich uh, in resources. So is Zimbabwe. Um, neither has had the kind of uh, economic uh, success or political stability that Botswana has enjoyed. So what Botswana did was to work with external actors, very interested in that diamond wealth, right? accept expertise, but critically cut a deal such that uh, at least in the initial development of the diamond industry, essentially it was uh, a partnership between the government of Botswana and De Beers, the big diamond house, right? So Botswana was able to keep its stake in this exploitation of these resources review that arrangement regularly to ensure that uh, skills transfer was happening, that more of the kind of value added uh, work that comes with that industry was being transferred to Botswana rather than simply being a source of raw diamonds. And, and then most essentially have in place the structure and scaffolding of sound governance and accountability so that the wealth that came from that then went into the roads that you drive on, the clean water that you drink, right? And not somebody's Swiss bank account. And this is a really important point. And then I'll stop because I want to hear from other people. But I, I do want to make this point. People talk a lot about corruption. Uh, when they talk about sort of the different African trajectories. And what I think is so important to acknowledge is that corruption happens in every society. There is no day you can read the news in the US without reading about corruption, without reading about the use of public office for private gain, right? The, there's nothing special about Africa. What, what distinguishes the different states uh, in the region in terms of how they've been able to deal with this is you know, what happens when corruption is exposed? Are people held accountable? Do the rules apply to everyone? Um, and one of the things that's made Botswana so successful uh, is that the rules do actually apply to everybody. If you get caught doing the wrong thing, you get in big trouble. Um, so that sort of system of governance of institutions and norms, that comes from Botswana. 
right? And then the external connectivity to the global economy, that's tremendously helpful, but you have to have both pieces to really make a successful go of it. Thank you, Michelle. Pauline or David, do you have any comments on what you've heard or uh, some of the exchanges you've had with other per panelists? Well, just to add to, uh, I think Michelle's last point about the fact that the there was a system in place in Botswana, which ensured that um, people are held accountable. And that cannot come from outside. That has to be uh, that has to be in place in the country. It must come from the country. It must be part of the country's policies. And that's why it works because we have many examples of foreign involvement in countries who do not have proper systems in place. And therefore those countries are not as successful. So I think the homegrown policy that ensures accountability that feeds uh, into um, development of the peoples are a critical part of the discussion. And just to add that for, in terms of civil society uh, and foreign uh, engagement, I think that's been a critical part of supporting civil society across the, the continent because um, civil society resources are very limited for most civil society across the continent and support from partners outside has played a major role in, in, in ensuring that civil society voices are, are able to be cultivated and, 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 and take part in discussions around the continent. So, so that's, that's a positive thing about foreign engagement and civil society. Uh, David, if you're speaking, we we can't hear you. Can you take your mute off? Unmute. There we go. There we go. I'm glad that uh, uh, Michelle touched on Botswana because one of my beacons of hope is the Botswana uh, sovereign wealth, where uh, adequate uh, measures have been taken to preserve. Uh, the revenues from diamond for future generations. Uh, but at the bottom of that to me is the issue of good governance and democracy. Because uh, why good governance? Because then transparency, accountability uh, will become part of that government's responsibility. Otherwise, uh, governments uh, who are supposed to be protecting their own, um, uh, their, their own people sometimes turn about to be the greatest danger to their own people and to their own resources. And it is true, Africa is rich in resources, but the big issue is how do we guarantee that there is, these resources are utilized and used well for the welfare and well-being of the communities. The other issue side of it is a democracy. You must allow people to exercise their God-given freedom to uh, decide on what they know, know best, what they want best. And therefore, even on their resources, they have to have that freedom, which democracy provides. So I think governance and democracy are part and parcel of uh, you know, this new Africa we're speaking of. Thank you. Thank you, David. And we've, we've noted the, the tension between there's two elements that are really critical for development in a lot of in African countries and countries around the world. Africa is not <laughs> unique in this, but you need both economic development and you need democracy and good governance. And you know, some people would say you need to develop your economy first before you can, you know, broaden democracy. You need a stronger governance, a stronger sort of benevolent authoritarian government to grow quickly. And, and then you can open up your government to democracy. And there's others that say you need to establish your, your strong democratic principles and roots in order to grow your economy. And I, I would ask your thoughts on you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg in that respect? 
I would say uh, good governance and democracy comes first because benevolent uh, dictatorial governments never graduate into any democratic governments. And if you don't get your house in order in the first place, the likelihood of you establishing a democratic system of government, a parliamentary system of government, a, a government that has sees justice and civil rights and human rights that can either it is set in stone right from the beginning or you will never get it. And therefore, before you think of, uh, you know, exploiting your resources, moving forward with your flag and so on, you better get your democracy and get your uh, uh, governance right. Do others have any comment on that one? Um, I think for us in Ghana, there was, um, it, it went hand in hand. So you had the um, Rawlings government come in on a coup, but start to implement economic reforms. And then based upon that graduated to uh, the democratic system that we have now. And so I think um, our experience has, is an example of how it could go hand in hand and how um, it, it's not necessarily an either or prospect that I would argue. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Pauline. Um, these things uh, go together. They're situational and specific. Uh, but one interesting thing about that, um, the kind of big picture global argument, which comes first, development or democracy, uh, is that right now in this competition for influence uh, that's taking place in Africa and elsewhere, particularly between the US and China, what you have very explicitly is uh, a Chinese um, model and, and kind of um, proposition that suggests you get faster growth uh, better without worrying about uh, democracy. Um, it's a it's a very very different idea. There's there's not necessarily even democracy sort of somewhere out there in the future. Um, it's just suggesting you can get the service delivery efficiency, economic growth, and prosperity without this kind of political baggage. Um, and and then a very different idea in the U.S. Uh, about um, not just growth but about kind of what people's aspirations are. So it's interesting to watch what. I remember as a, as a kind of chicken egg debate uh, a couple decades ago is now taking on this geopolitical uh, competition um, veneer. Uh, and it's an, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, it play out, but I really agree with uh, Pauline. And, and one reason I'm so glad we have our perspective is because I think uh, when you talk to people about that or critically when you do polling, right? So Afrobarometer does really great polling on the continent. And consistently, it shows that people want both these things. They want service delivery. They want jobs. They want their government to work with healthcare and infrastructure. Equally, they absolutely want democracy. They want to be able to hold officials accountable. They want to be able to get rid of them if they're not doing their, their job. They want freedom of expression. Um, so you know, I take heart in this as someone who spent a lot of time working for the American government and has a certain idea about sort of what I believe to be universal rights that um, consistently people on the ground express their desire for both of these things, not one at the expense of the other. Thank you. And I would imagine that having the authoritarian government develop first would make the work that Pauline does with civil society organizations that much more difficult and have that much of a bigger challenge ahead of them to overcome uh, that um, authoritarian type uh, government. We do have a question from a participant uh, in the audience here today that has been studying China for what China has been doing in Africa for a while. And the person is fav favorably impressed. And from my experience, you see you, China, you know, providing loans, building infrastructure, roads, different sort of uh, government buildings. Um, there's other stuff that China does in, in Africa. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about China's 
influence and China's engagement in Africa. Um, I'll open it up to any of the panelists that would like to respond to that. Let me take first stab. Um, China is not benevolent, uh, and its um, its interest in Africa is a very self-serving one. Um, it's, and I would imagine that's the same for almost every country that that uh, wants an economic partnership with Africa. And so, um, when China gives, um, and sometimes they give to the point that you have to be very careful about what they're giving and what is being given uh, back to China. Case in point, um, we have a case where Ghana is receiving, is receiving some loans from China, but in return for that, they're going to be exploiting our bauxite in one of the most sensitive ecological zones in the country. And the, then the question of, is that beneficial to us? So when you have that huge amount from China, which supports infrastructural development to the destruction of our environment, are we actually gaining or losing? And therefore, would we want that kind of um, engagement? There's also a thing about human rights as um, I think China may not put up the kind of conditionalities that other spaces do, but they also don't check, offer checks and balances that we would have hoped that they could in, in, given the, 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 their might and their power. Could I? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, after you, Dr. Bassioni. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> Is that all right? Or are you going to give me a, a larger screen? Um, the I think uh, there are a good sides uh, and bad sides too. It's a mixed uh, sort of blessing, as I said in the beginning. And it is because uh, when China invests in infrastructure or in the development of resources, exploitation development resources, uh, it's a good thing because there are some permanent uh, sort of benefits that are left for the country. And the country might not on its own be able to do that. But I think the downside is what you should really be questioning. The downside is uh, at what cost? And we said, uh, if you want to hold a government responsible and accountable for the utilization of its resources, then whichever, uh, Porter or whichever country is helping it to develop those resources ought to have some leverage on making the government accountable. And that is not happening. Uh, there are certain conditions, international norms on human rights, on civil rights, on, on the uh, need for accountability and transparency. If we do not guarantee this by what we get from a friend that is able to invest in us, then I don't think that is really entirely a, a very beneficial relationship. Although we can say, yes, it is good, uh, but we need to be uh, on our guard. We need to be sure that we are actually uh, on top and uh, in charge of what is happening in our previous, uh, in our own various countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassioni. We have a, question from a attendee in Berlin who says that 2020 brought light to the fact that one in 10 jobs worldwide are in tourism. In Africa, one job supports at least six people, yet the participant never hears about tourism as a part of these conversations about development in Africa. Would one of the panelists want to speak to the importance of, of tourism with respect to Africa, uh, different countries in Africa? I know e each country has its own uh, unique situation, but how does tourism play into development and a positive future for Africa? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I, it's, it's one of many important sectors, right? Um, so 
I'll go back to Botswana where diamond mining has been so dominant in the economy and, and diversifying that economy has been a tough struggle for successive um, governments uh, in that country. Uh, and tourism has been where they've had the most success. Uh, so it, it is a significant uh, part of uh, the overall economic pie and, and they've you know, proceeded because they do benefit from sound governance models. They've uh, proceeded with it in, in such a way that it dovetails with their conservation goals, which are significant. And you have to think about, uh, depending on what kind of tourism you're talking about, the, the footprint uh, that it comes with. Um, so I do think, you know, you're right. Uh, tourism is a significant sector for uh, a number of African economies, and it's, it's been just devastated uh, by the global pandemic, uh, as, as that sector has been every place else. Um, and I think it's important when we think about African economies that we do think beyond the extractive sectors, um, services, uh, tech economies, which are such a big part of Nigeria and Ghana and Kenya, you, you know, it's a, it's a, the same complete, complex and varied picture that you find anywhere else in the world. So it is really important to get ourselves past this idea that it's all extraction and subsistence agriculture, right? There is subsistence agriculture, there is abstraction, there's also commercial agriculture and service and tech and, and uh, all of those pieces. And when you, when you think about both African demographics, right? And how you build an economy that accommodates a huge amount of young people, but also how Africa fits into a global economy where some regions are aging very, very rapidly. It raises a set of interesting questions and opportunities. And it, it, it is really important that we, um, you know, kind of move past uh, some of those uh, first perceptions and, and look at the whole picture. Um, just to add something um, in terms of tourism, I think it's also important to look at who controls the the whole, um, let's say, value chain in tourism, um, where the bulk of the profits go to, and who controls that. And unfortunately, I think it suffers just like many other sectors in, in Africa, where um, uh, control is not necessarily remaining, remaining in, in, in the countries involved because you have, um, especially where those countries where tourism is, is huge business, Kenya is an example, you might have the parent company of the tourism com uh, company outside the continent, therefore profits are repatriated. And then the kind of uh, profits that stay in the country are also limited. And so therefore there's a need to think about how we can, uh, we can touch that, that model as it exists right now to ensure that a greater value from the whole tourism experience remains in the country and therefore contributes to the national uh, kitty. Okay, and we've, we've just got two minutes left and I, I wanna just put one, one question out there for uh, Dr. Bassioni. We have a question from the audience that says, do African countries prescribe to the African, do African countries that are members of the African Union, or is there a feeling of nationalism? Okay, I think the question is looking at, do countries think of themselves as African countries, or do they think of their nationalistic roots first? How much do they, ascribe to the African Union mindset versus their own nationalistic outlook. We've just got two minutes left. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say uh, the, the pool and power of sovereignty is quite strong. And uh, it's difficult for um, uh, African countries, just as you have seen European countries and UK for that matter, actually subjugate their own sovereignty to the overall sovereignty of a union. And so that is also true for the African Union. Uh, they're all ascribed, they are all committed members of uh, the union, but uh, the national interest sometimes overrides the pan-African interest. And so there is still that pool there. 
Uh, so you still see pull and push about that. Actually, this uh, gives me, drives me back to South Sudan. Um, when South Sudan was moving towards uh, a referendum, uh, the greatest fear that referendum might not be allowed and the country might not uh, receive independence was the African Union, because each member of those countries has internal problems within its boundaries. The colonial uh, past has uh, disaffected groups in the country who want to peel off and secede and become independent. So the fear was that uh, they might not actually all agree on South Sudan becoming independent. It was just by luck and the referendum was overwhelming. 95% of the people voted for seceding and they had no choice except to accept that. So yes, I would say it will take time before um, African countries uh, subjugate themselves to the greater Pan-Africanism. Thank you so much. And we've reached the, the end of our time today. We've, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of learning about the, the wonderful diversity and interesting aspects uh, around the continent of Africa. Um, I wanna thank our panelists today who volunteer their time to participate in the Conference on World Affairs. If you'd like to support our panelists and their work, you can find their full bios online with links to their books, podcasts, and social media accounts. I also wanna remind people that the CWA uh, relies on the generosity of people like you to make the, this event possible. If you'd like to make a donation or make a gift to the CWA, that can be done through the CWA website online. And with that, I'll close this session and you can uh, look to the schedule online to look at other interesting panels that will be taking place throughout the week. Thank you very much. Thank you.